Welcome to Discovering. Tonight we're back on Isle Royal. We're chatting with the researchers of the Michigan Tech Wolf and Moose Project to get an update on those populations and to learn a little bit more about the research that they do. The place needs the top predator, a giant herbivore, and the vegetation. I mean, all three levels need to be working, and the top level wasn't working, so. Uh, but it, it was an easy fix. Let's bring in some more wolves and let them start it all over. So sit back and relax. It's Monday night and it's time for Discovering. The secret streams that flow beneath the cliffs of colored stone. Forest thick and healthy with birch and pine and oak. Surrounded by the greatest lakes this world has ever known. Black Bear's awesome presence as he roams the hills and fields. Call of the timber wolf, the loon's lonesome trill. The eagle soaring high above, the trout lies deep and still. These are what I treasure, the only way I measure. Feelings that I have for this fine land There is so much to discover When you're a long-time lover Of northern Michigan Isle Royal is known for being an isolated island wilderness and national park, and for the moose and wolves who inhabit it. While I was on the island last month, I had a chance to visit with the researchers from Michigan Tech to learn more about what they do and the current state of the wolves and moose of Isle Royal. Wolves and moose on Isle Royal have had this uh, interesting history. Prior to about the year 1900, there had not been moose on Isle Royal, but there had been caribou. And at about that time, caribou went extinct and moose arrived to Isle Royal. It's not known for sure how they got to Isle Royal. Very likely they swam. They're quite capable of making the swim and it's difficult to account for how else they may have gotten there. Moose were on Isle Royal without any predator for about 50 years, from about the year 1900 to about the year 1950. Then in about the year 1950, wolves arrived to Isle Royal for the first time in historic times. So for the first time since perhaps 1880 or something like that. Prior to that, we, we don't really know. And so from about 1950 onward, there have been wolves and moose on the island both li living together. You might be aware that this isn't the first time the Park Service uh, attempted to put wolves into the park. There was an effort in the 50s. After one or two wolves made it to Isle Royal on their own, in 1952, four wolves were stocked on Isle Royal from the Detroit Zoo, of which two, including Big Jim as seen here, are thought to have survived. So it was the Park Service who, you know, sought out somebody to come here and study, you know, these new, new members of the ecosystem and uh, developed a relationship you know, with Dewar Allen at Purdue, and of course that rolled into Dave Meach and Rolf Peterson, and so, you know, the Park Service annually um, allocates funding for that purpose, and we've been in a long-term um, agreement with Michigan Tech to, you know, count the wolves and the moose here at the park, and, and then of course, being the good scientists that they are, they are also delving into all other aspects of uh, what it means for, to the ecosystem to have them present. Part of the work that we've been doing is trying to understand how um, moose are impacting the forest. So for the last few years, the moose population has been really high, uh, around uh, 1,800 moose to 2,000 moose. So that's quite a lot of animals on such a small island. And, um, you know, every day a moose can eat quite a lot of vegetation, up to 30 pounds a day in the summertime. So obviously with that amount of animals eating that amount of food, it can have really big impacts on, on the ve vegetation in the forest. So, and at the West End, um, you know, if you kind of look around, you see that what should be trees are kind of sh look like shrubs and things like that. So that, that's one of the main focuses of our, our research here. And, and another aspect is trying to assess the health of the, the moose population and looking at parasites like uh, winter ticks. 
um, and also just their nutritional health as they're impacting the forests and that slows the growth of certain trees. How does that feed back to impact the health of the moose population? The island after 2014 and 15 had only two wolves left and they'd been declining for several years because of inbreeding. I mean, it was just a collapse of the population from too much inbreeding caused by a lack of opportunity for new wolves to get here because it's, it's uh, rare that we have ice to the mainland these days. So it's, the ice has been going down and down for decades. And those last two wolves were um, fully expected to die before ever reproducing, which would have uh, driven the population to extinction. That circumstance, the wolves not doing so well, led the National Park Service to consider whether it would be right to bring wolves back. In 2018-19, after several years of deliberation and consideration and environmental impact study, the National Park Service decided to, rest to restart the wolf population with a brand new bunch of wolves from the mainland, from as diverse a bunch of directions and genetics as they could get to uh, reestablish wolves in order to basically control moose so that the forest itself would not be so heavily impacted by moose. And then in early spring of 2019, we put wolves in and then um, by that time, we had 15 wolves, and then in the fall of 2019, uh, additional wolves. And so, in total, 19 wolves by the fall of 2019. Uh, everybody on all sides of the lake was very helpful and take some of our wolves. <laughs> so some of the wolves came from uh, the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, some came from Minnesota, and some came from an island called Mishapakotan. It's an island uh, that uh, belongs to the Ontario province of Canada. Actually from Ontario came some wolves that are quite a bit larger than, than the wolves from Minnesota or Michigan or the wolves that we had here for 70 years. So uh, these are among the largest wolves in North America now, potentially. So they, they may bring on a whole new set of wolf moose relationships that that we're not used to seeing so that's that's rather exciting so the the first year or two of these wolves life on isle royal is basically about forming new alliances that will become packs. And for the f first year that we have been able to monitor wolves in Iowa, that's been kind of the dominant theme is these wolves kind of sorting that business out. What follows right after that is, is uh, reproduction. By March of, or let's just say April of 2020, we had about 12 to 14 wolves and then an unknown number of pups. We knew we had litters that were born on the island just didn't have an accurate count of, you know, how many pups. And reasonably good survival, the pups from all indications, which are just a few fragments of wolves on remote cameras and so forth, they looked like they were well-developed and well-fed. So uh, should be doing pretty well. Our next chance to take a look at all this is this next January and February coming up in 2022. By then, I'm sure we'll have figured in many of the kind of missing details uh, about what's happening with the wolves. And so, so that's, that's the wolves. What about the moose? Well, during roughly the same time period, we can say about the last 10 to 15 years, wolves have been very low in abundance. And it was an opportunity for the moose population to really grow. And it grew explosively. It grew so much that the moose population was really starting to have a he heavy impact on its own food supply, especially its winter food supply. The most recent count that we have on Isle Royal Moose is again from a little over a year ago when we estimated there to be about 1,900 moose. That's almost twice the average abundance, kind of long-term average for the island. You know, people sometimes ask, often ask in fact, um, you know, what, what are the right numbers for wolves and moose on the island? put some numbers on it, with some hesitation on my own behalf. You know, long-term average number of moose is about a thousand. And it's frequently fluctuated between about, say, 700 and 1,500. When there's that many moose, the vegetation on Isle Royal seems to 
do pretty well, a lot of vibrant growth and that sort of thing. Um, there's never really been a concern of too few moose. They've always been able to keep their numbers up in that way. And then occasionally when there's more than 17, 1800 moose, then their, then their impacts are, are, are kind of important. For wolves, there really has is, is never been a concern about too many wolves because when you get close to that concern, they usually have eaten so many moose that they've undercut their own food supply and then the wolf population starts to decline. The worries go up when there's less than about 10. But even, even that number 10 is not enough to quite know what's going on because if it's 10 and the wolves are doing well in the sense of they're killing wolves or killing moose frequently and they're having pups, you know, well, 10 is probably soon gonna be a bigger number. But if they're 10 and on the decline, well, then that's a, a different circumstance and you'd, you'd be more concerned about extinction and wondering if something should be done to kind of mitigate that risk. Studies of wolves and moose on Isle Royale National Park, they represent the longest study of any predator-prey system in the whole world. The project began in 1959, and so that means the project is now more than six decades old. One of the themes that's been with us always, first is methodological, just very simply counting wolves and moose every year. It's so simple but it becomes very special when it gets done year after year after year because that's where the insights come from to be able to see what all these uh, longer term patterns are all about. If you look at like any three to five year part of the 60 years that it's been going on, you would get possibly the wrong impression of, about the system overall. Um, nature's complicated. The other thing that's been a constant is, uh, is the reason why we do it. And uh, there's two reasons why. One is, is very basic, very scientific, and it has to do with just kind of understanding how and why it is that wolf and moose populations fluctuate the way they do. Do wolves have a big impact on moose or not so much? Do moose have a big impact on the wolves or not so much? That's the big question. So in the springtime, we typically spend around six weeks in the, in the early springtime collecting data um, on parasites and, and tip, uh, ticks and moose, um, and also moose impacts on balsam fir. And then also in the wintertime, between three and seven weeks, um, I typically be out here doing field work. In the wintertime, we're mostly doing field work from small airplanes, so flying around, trying to count the number of moose on the island, trying to um, count the number of wolves and observe their behavior and you know, see if they've reproduced and things like that as well. So um, also collecting samples and things like that that we'll process um, to kind of get an idea about moose health and other things like that. Oh, we're here right now at Wendigo at the southwest end of Isle Royale to, to launch and get back uh, teams of volunteers, members of the public who are, uh, have signed up for Moose Watch, which is a, a volunteer project where experienced backpackers come for a week. We put them in a group and they go off cross country looking for dead moose. Uh, moose bones, skeletons that have been laying there for 20 years or moose that just killed over last week. We now have um, the, the world's largest collection of moose bones and we can use those to ask a, a really wide range of different questions. So we know from, from that collection, we know a lot about wolf behavior um, and whether certain types of individuals are more likely to be killed by wolves than not. And from that we find, you know, typically older individuals uh, tend to be more likely to be killed by wolves and, and those with kind of arthritis or other diseases. Um, we were able to study a lot of um, bone diseases in the moose, so things like arthritis. And we were able to find out um, that moose that are malnourished or slightly impoverished when they're young, in, their, in the mother's womb, and like their first year of life, those that are have poor nutrition, they're way more likely to develop arthritis as they age. We've got moose teeth that have been collected over a 60 year period. And so you were able to, when moose um, our teeth are developing, they incorporate heavy metals into, I mean, if there is heavy metals in the, 
environment, they're incorporated into the teeth. So we have teeth from this huge period. And so there was work done looking at the heavy metals, um, mercury and lead particularly, in these moose teeth, where you could clearly see when the Clean Air Act was instituted, the teeth after that had far fewer heavy metals in it. You don't know always what is going to be so important. Of course, this is only a small view of all the research done here. So if you're interested in more about the wolves and moose of Isle Royal, I encourage you to visit the website isleroyalwolf.org. Giant woolly mammoth tusks are typically found in Alaska or Siberia. I stopped in for a look at one in Rapid River. I bought this mammoth tusk about five years ago from a gold miner in Alaska. I told him that I wanted to buy a big tusk if he ever found a, a giant tusk. And he called me one day and said, hey, I, I just found the biggest tusk that, that he had personally ever found. So I had the tusk for about four years and there's really no good way to display it because it, it actually hooks out and it's, it's hard to mount. And finally I got a hold of Tim Gerenshin at North Country Legends Taxidermy and, and said, Tim, I, I have another project for you. We had to build and fabricate uh, metal brackets with clamps on it to hold this in because it is 260 pounds of the highest graded ivory in the world. It's all blue-green. This had to have been buried for approximately 100,000 years in the right conditions to naturally color itself blue-green. Tim had the bracket built and then he built a wood frame around it so that he could attach all of this fake rock that, that looks like I wanted it to look like permafrost, like it was melting out of the permafrost. So he gets about halfway through it and I called him, I said, hey Tim, I've got these mammoth teeth laying around that we make knife handles out of as well. Can you incorporate a few of those into the display? This is actually a fossilized woolly mammoth tooth that is inside of a fossilized jawbone. So he incorporated both of these, these big molars into the entire display. We were both on the same page as to kind of what I wanted. I gave Tim my idea. And when I left, I knew he would hit a home run uh, because he's a, he's a great, he's an artist. And uh, he really did. Uh, this is a one of a kind display. I've never seen one like it anywhere. I wasn't nervous about it. I knew Tim would do a great job and, and he absolutely did. So the woolly mammoth was so massive. They had to eat 800 pounds of foliage a day to survive. So that the only thing that killed them, they would either starve or they'd fall into these tar pits. So they'd walk into these marshes that were, that were full of lush grass and everything. Between 30 and 40,000 pounds, they'd walk in and they would literally sink. So this gold miner I bought it from mines with water cannons. They don't break this stuff. It just washes out of the hillside. This is about the average size mammoth tusk found uh, in Alaska where, where the gold mining took place. where this came from and this is a pretty common size tusk. These two came out of the same, the same spot, the same mine. The big molar in the bottom of this base came out of that same pit as this mammoth and the molar on the other side actually came out of the Bering Sea. So when I buy ivory and it comes in smaller tusks like that, we cut them up into, into sets of scales like this. We incorporate them into pocket knives, fixed blade knives, the inner core, no matter how old it is, is, is still fairly white and it's hard to tell that it's, it's mammoth tusk. So we, we typically just use the outer bark. We also use the mammoth molars. You can see the pattern of the tooth inside that entire handle and that's all mammoth uh, molars. These are dyed. Uh, if the tooth is not completely fossilized, you, we can pull a dye through it and dye the tooth, which makes a, a beautiful knife handle. The guy in Anchorage that did the restoration on the tusk, once he knew it was done drying, he started polishing it and he started calling me wanting to buy it. And he, he told me that in all the years that he's been doing it, he's never seen a tusk this big with blue-green ivory from the root all the way to the tip. and. Uh, I wasn't willing to sell it to him. So uh, we put it on a semi and, and um, it was the only thing on the truck. The truck driver spent three days at the Canadian border and three days at the United States border 
And when he got here, he was very confused. He, he really wanted to know what was in his truck. And uh, we took the lid off of the crowbar and his reaction was priceless. <laughs> I said, that's why I didn't want you to know it was in the truck while you were, while you were driving. Thanks for watching, and I hope to see you next week right here on Upper Michigan's very own Discovering.